Dr. Manzur Ali Khan, MBBS, PhD, MBA, FRCS, FACS, and many more, many more degrees. He's a consultant, esophagogastric, general and trauma surgeon at Brighton and Sussex uh, University Trust. He's an honorary professor of general surgery at the University of Sussex. Which has not been documented there in the brief description is he served in Royal Navy and rose up to the level of surgeon command and served there for two weeks, two more than 20 decades, two decades to reach uh, the provides the highest service that one could provide as a military surgeon. He has many publications on trauma and plus his other specialties. Today, he would be talking to us about the definitive trauma skills course, a, a course which he has been a part for a longer period. What do you say? What I'm going to talk to you about today is the trauma training pathway we currently have in the UK and pay a particular focus to the definitive surgical trauma skills course. As with any talk that I give, the first of all disclaimer side is this talk represent my views, mine alone, and not anybody of any significance or importance. The content of today's talk is going to be to give you an introduction to trauma training, the purpose of trauma training, and also to talk about the exsanguinating patient. And finally, what I'll do is give you an overview of the pathway that we have. So the objectives here are to give you an overview of the UK trauma training pathway and also the gold standard resuscitative surgery course, which probably do have a conflict of interest. I'm one of the course directors alongside one of my colleagues who will be presenting later on, Mr. Elwin. And um, yeah, it's a pretty good course and I'll tell you more about it shortly. What you need to remember, whenever you have a course, a course by itself in isolation will never give you the competency in to undertake that procedure. What a course usually does is either start you on your journey or consolidate your expertise in a fashion so you can go and implement it. When we look at the Definitive Surgical Trauma Skills course, it's a really good course. It gives you hands-on application, appreciation of various maneuvers, various exposures, but the course in itself will not teach you how to do trauma. What you then have to do is go away and regularly expose yourself to maintain your competencies. And you are only part of a, you're only a small part of a larger system. I could be phenomenal at trauma surgery, could stop anything bleeding, but if there is no pre-hospital services to deliver the patient to me, if there is no reception of the patient and initial management of the patient there is no appreciation of the physiology changes especially during general anesthesia and then also post-operative care my operative skills are pretty useless because i'm only a small facet of a larger piece so every single aspect of the system must be taught and surgery is an integral component of a wider system. Always remember that the system saves the individual, not the individual. And just to show you that they do work, prior to 2011, 2012, you know, surgeons can operate. What happened here was 2012, 2013, trauma systems were initiated. And you can see the odds ratio for survival has increased year in, year out since this implementation. So although I will keep saying this, although surgery is obviously the most important thing, it is only the most important thing alongside a lot of other most important things. So pre-hospital services, emergency department, anesthesia, critical care, and not forgetting the rehabilitating patient back into society. Now, what kills patients after major trauma? Well, I really do like this infographic and you can see head injuries. They can kill people up to six days. And the reason why this occurs is none of you have ever worked with a neurosurgeon who has seen the CT on admission and said, patient is unsurvivable. You know what? Let's withdraw. What tends to happen is you have this catastrophic hit or maybe you see nothing on CT scan, but the patient takes a few days to manifest themselves, a few days to show that they are not going to improve. 
You can see at the bottom there, hemorrhage kills within the first day, okay? Majority of patients in the first few hours. So the key thing, what we teach on the Definitive Surgical Trauma Skills course is how to be a resuscitative surgeon, okay? How do we stop exsanguination from happening? Compressible hemorrhage, really straightforward to sort out. You put tourniquets on, you put dressings on, you compress. Non-compressible torso hemorrhage, i.e. stuff going on in the chest, in the abdomen, and in the pelvis, that is what we focus upon on this course. So what is damage control surgery? Personally, I don't like this phrase. I think it creates a sense of panic and grab. What we tend to do in this, we are operating to help restore patient physiology. And the only way to restore patient physiology is to stop them exsanguinating. That's it, turn the tap off. So what you need to do is do what you need to do at that moment in time, preempt what is required to be done later so you don't burn any bridges. This is where experience comes in. When you attend a course, the course gives you the benefits of actually doing the manual procedures, but you also get the option of interacting. Actually, it's not option, it's mandated. You interact with the faculty and you learn from the mistakes faculty have made so you don't make them. That is the purpose of teaching to actually spread knowledge so people do not mistake, um, make the same mistakes you have already made. So what I like to call this, alongside a number of my colleagues, is we don't call it damage control surgery. We're not damage control surgeon. We're physiological surgeons. We try and restore physiology and we are not bound by the anatomical boundaries. Pretty simple. Now, why do we need this? Well, in the good old days, when you were a general surgeon, you did a bit of orthopedics, you did a bit of VNT, a bit of vascular, but you had exposure to absolutely everything. And then you actually subspecialize. But unfortunately, nowadays, subspecialization has occurred and we're focusing on specific operations, not even specific regions, okay? Not even, say, for example, lower GI. Some individuals may be doing right-sided operations, other left-sided operations. So we are limiting what our exposure is. There is also less open work. Individuals are becoming more familiar with doing laparoscopic, endovascular, robotic procedures, and not au fait with rapid access, open procedures to control this. I've already mentioned that. And bizarrely, I found this quite ironic, is nowadays a lot of fellowships are concentrating on open work because everybody is familiar with the laparoscopic. So what do we need in the future, okay? Well, we need to bring back the general surgeon and I hate to say it, that's not gonna happen because there is no demand for it. Current way of remuneration structures are all done for elective surgery, not as much for trauma and emergency surgery, which conversely, you do need probably the most experienced surgeons undertaking because the interventions are time critical. Now, currently in the UK, the training pathway, if we look at the second column, we have our foundation years and core trainee years. And during that time, an individual will do the MRCS, ATLS and CRISP. So basically the foundations of understanding surgical principles, how to look after the sick patients. Then when you become the higher surgical training, you actually undertake the relevant courses, advanced laparoscopic skills, advanced um, oncological skills. You undertake your fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons. And in this period, ideally towards the last two years of their training, you undertake the Definitive Surgical Trauma Skills course. Because we only like individuals to come on that course who know how to operate, who know the anatomy, who are au fait, shall we say, with a number of the procedures, but we can, on the course, expose them to experienced faculty and also specific techniques and skills. There are no tricks or, you know, skills in surgery. There are only techniques which have been refined. And then finally, you can undertake a fellowship, whether this be oncological, for those who want to wish that way, but we also have specific trauma fellowships available now in the UK, which concentrate more on two aspects. In fact, the resuscitative surgery aspect where you go to high volume operative trauma centers, or, or then also the MDM management skills, which can be undertaken by array of specialities, not specifically surgical. So the Defensive Surgical Trauma Skills Course, 
It's a highly practical course that teaches procedures and surgical techniques required to manage the exsanguinating polytrauma patient. That is what it's there for, okay? The majority of the course is spent in the skills lab, working in small groups on fresh frozen cadavers. And the small groups are maximum participants of four and every single station has a fresh frozen cadaver and an experienced faculty member who has been undertaking trauma surgery for a minimum of five years, shall we say, but comes really quite experienced. Alongside this, while we're in the lab, there are lectures, case studies, and ongoing opportunities with the faculty while procedures are being undertaken to discuss trauma management. One of the key aspects of this is there is an online library of about 40 videos looking at every trauma surgical procedure, uh, which is annotated, voiceover by a anatomist, and also annotated with all of the steps alongside the video. So it's almost like having another book, but an online resource showing the videos, showing the maneuvers, but then text to follow it. So really, really useful. So not only do you have this material, online learning material, you have access to faculty, you have access to the cadavers, um, but you also have access to the text, which I'll come on to later. Following the course, the candidates have described they're able to organize and plan how to make life-saving decisions in trauma and emergency environment. The techniques are one aspect of this. What we try and introduce individuals to is thinking on their feet, conducting small MDMs and actually making a management plan. Because the key thing when you've got an exsanguinating patient in front of you is to make a decision. There is very little time for you to spend pondering what should be done, you have to make a decision because that promotes patient pathway through, uh, sorry, the journey through the pathway while the patient is in hospital. So say, for example, a patient comes in who's dropping their systolic to SEMTI. I say, right, this person needs to go to, operative, um, to the operating theatre because I don't know where they're bleeding from. If I'm taking them to the operating theatre and for about five or 10 minutes, their blood pressure has suddenly risen and been 100 systolic, I can then change my mind and maybe take them to the CT scan. But what I've done is actually move the patient out of the resuscitation room and carried them through on their journey so the patient is making progress. Be able to describe the philosophy of damage control, i.e. stop the hypothermia, coagulopathy and acidosis and also correct the hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia. So all of that is always running in your mind. Remember, we're operating to patient physiology. We also explain quite a lot on the pathophysiology and physics of wound ballistics and blast injury, especially because it will dis demonstrate mechanisms of injury and why some patients don't survive, even with negligible overt injuries. And recognize and appropriately manage the exsanguinating patient, i.e. this person needs the tap turned off quickly recognize the patient in need of emergent, immediate surgery and hemorrhage control. As I say, there are three questions that need to be answered, okay? Does this patient need an operation? Yes or no? How quickly is this operation needed? Immediate, can take a bit of time. And then finally, what is the operation they require? Those are the three fundamental questions I always ask myself when I see somebody in the resuscitation room is, does this patient need an operation? How quickly do they need it? What operation do they need? And all of these procedures are simulated. I'll show you the timetable shortly. Thoracic trauma, loops going from an anterolateral to a clamshell, looking at cardiac lung injuries, hilar and peripheral in nature, looking at vascular trauma up until the base of the skull, down to the antecubital fossa, and down all the way to the popliteal vessels. Also taking into account forearm fasciotomies and lower limb fasciotomies, looking at penetrating neck injuries, exposing the vasculature and looking at the aerodigestive system, thoracic outlet and upper limb trauma, looking at extra thoracic control of upper limb vessels, lower limb trauma, pelvic trauma, including extra peritoneal pelvic packing and all aspects of abdominal trauma as well and exposures looking at removal of the spleen, dealing with liver injuries, pancreatic injuries, renal, and then also looking at the zone one, two, and three retroperitoneal vasculature. 
This is a sample timetable of what is involved. And as you can see, this is pretty full on, but a lot of time is spent at the table with experienced faculty talking you through it. Second day, as you can see, the first day is spent, majority of the morning is spent in the chest and the afternoon is spent on the neck and the upper limb. The following day, the morning is spent on the lower limb, including extraperitoneal pelvic packing and control of the extraperitoneal iliac vessels. And then in the afternoon, everything related to the intra-abdominal and retroperitoneal structures. And no talk would be a talk that I give if I wouldn't plug my own book. This is the text which accompanies the Definitive Surgical Trauma Skills course. And I would be biased, but I think it's a pretty good book. We've got a great array of authors who have contributed to it. And I do recommend anybody interested in trauma read this. So in summary, in order for you to be a good trauma surgeon, you must be a good general surgeon to start off with. A course in isolation cannot teach you how to be a trauma surgeon. Regular exposure to trauma is the key into maintaining skills. Thank you very much for your time and I believe it's time to take questions. Thank you. Duncan, who is one of the consultant surgeons at Dysfunctional Hospital Chilla, and he's one of the limited trainers in uh, the, the National Trauma Management course and ATLS in Sri Lanka and one of the uh, trainers of in the recognized uh, Colombo University Postgraduate Institute of Medicine to accommodate uh, senior registrars in training in special interest in trauma in Sri Lankan setting. On a personal note, I could recall him as a third year medical student when he was an intern at Colombo South and he was rising above us when we were trainees. We are happy to take his pathway as junior surgeons in Sri Lanka. And now it's my time to uh, in, uh, invite Dr. Kamal Jayasudhi to provide these uh, reactions. Over to you, Kamal. Thank you, Mikmal, for your introduction. And Dr. Mansur Paul, Professor Mansur Khan, thank you for your thought provocating uh, lecture. Actually, I impressed in your few slides and few comments. So I mentioned few of them, train the system, not the individual. So that is a significant comment for everyone. Because as you said, we are a small part of the system. So to get the individual outcome, we need, as you said, to train the system. So let me share one of my experience in related to DSTC. So I got the opportunity to do the DSTC in 2010. And actually the first manual was published in 2003. Then that was the third manual when I was there. I think it was probably second or third manual. And then I was there in the guest faculty and now I'm an uh, international faculty in DSTC. But first, uh, clamshell and first twisting of lung done by me after the experience of DSTC. I learned it, I read it, but I haven't done it. So after DSTC, I got the opportunity to do it in a live session. I mean, live uh, casualty uh, with application of the principles correctly. And one more thing, Professor Mansur Khan, uh, be a physiological surgeon. I'm sure that I don't know you before, but this is one of my words for my playlist. Think about the physiology always. I didn't use the word physiological surgeon, so I'm going to use it from today onwards. Thank you for that impression. And then the back to the general surgeons. That's a very good uh, approach. And in trauma, we should have a lot of experience and we should have exposure and we should know the anatomy of the whole body because we have to stop the bleeding and we have to take the decision. Again, it impressed me about that three questions. Uh, 
I'm not sure, but these three questions, there are evidence uh, even in the panel. Of course, I'm also asking from them. He's very impressed. Uh, do you need surgery? When to do surgery and what to do? Okay, let me share the situation in Sri Lanka. Now, we don't have DSTC. In the training path, you mentioned the as same in the student, the medical students, they will go for some formal training in their clinical sessions. And after that, we have what is called National Trauma Management Course. That was started in 1994, but in uh, Riyadh Sikh, under the auspices of Riyadh Sikh, it is 1999. From 2009, we are conducting this National Trauma Management course as the basic course, that is ATLS principles. And with this course, they will get qualified to do a uh, definitive decision-making course. So actually we have trained about 2,500 students and uh, presently I'm the director of that. Dr. Ranjit Telawla was the founder of it in Sri Lanka. And we have completed 53 courses. And new future for this course is that we are now uh, deciding to evaluate the outcome of the course. And as you said, how it affects the system. We do have a system, but that is not a well-developed trauma system. But this is the primary course. And then in, as you mentioned in the training path, they, at last there was DSTC. So to apply this decision-making principles for the postgraduate, we develop a course, this is called decision-making in major trauma, the same principles as DSTC. And for the nurses, we have developed nursing training trauma course. So it's a pleasure in this evening to have a chat and understanding the system in a developed trauma, a developed country, and just to share our system, how we achieve because of lack of facilities and lack of financials, still to train our students and train our postgraduates. So at last, what I must say, we should be physiological surgeons. Thank you, Professor Maksudu.